Hello, I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom, with our host, the Reverend Joseph Hinchy and Lisa Fertini Campbell. Now here's Lisa. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. Welcome everyone to the next installment of the series we're calling The Healing Wounds of Christ with the Reverend Joseph Henshi of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. Hello, Father. Hello, Lisa. Well, this is the day the Lord let, has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. 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 So, Father, uh, as you begin to lead us uh, again on, could you remind us what we covered in the last hour, and then a preview of what we're going to do this hour. Yes, and you, as you could well imagine, this is a very complex reality. The the healing wounds of really are a revelation of God's love and mercy. So we're giving now, first we gave a kind of a background for this, developing a little bit the text from Zechariah. The young king Josiah died in the plains of Megiddo, and he was mourned as an only only son, and he was called the pierced one. The pierced one yes. Well, that then leads us to the theology of the lamb and the precious and the precious blood. So we saw the importance of blood. We saw the institution of the feast of blood or pa- Passover. That this was a mutual covenant. It was a victim of expiation, washed away our sins, and purified the whole sanctuary. So then we developed a very brief excursus on the precious blood, leading primarily to 1 Peter, and that's what we'll do today. We reached the point in this discussion about some of the fathers of the church. We'll do this more fully uh, a bit further down in our third excursus. This is the first, then the pierced side is the second, and the third one will be on the the development of this ideal in the early church through the St. Augustine, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, right down to our own day. Ah, so much, much to look forward mm-hmm. to, I think. So will you begin us with All a prayer? Right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray for us, holy spouses, Mary and Joseph, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. St. Gaspar Bertoni, please pray for us all. In the name, in the name of the, the Father, Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Okay, Father. So we'll continue on in this first excursus, a reflection on the precious blood uh, by uh, developed, as we'll see, in First Peter. So as a preparation for this, we find that the medieval doctors that will be presented more deeply below were piqued and tremendously interested in this mystery of, of the wounds of Christ, especially that in the side of Christ, as we'll see. We know that Christ is said to have paid the price of our redemption, his own precious blood, not to the devil as Origen and some other early church writers thought, but to God, Father, Son, and Holy that the precious blood of Christ was the price of our redemption in Him. We have redemption through His blood. We have redemption in Him, of course. He brought about two effects. Firstly, God has proposed one man from the part of Christ, and secondly, on the part of God. On the part of Christ, of course, He gave up all that He had, and the part of God using this as the price of our redemption and of full mercy. So, in the development of this text of First Peter, as I mentioned, I'm going to follow a, I believe it was a young uh, Indian father who wrote his doctorate on First Peter, and I'm kind of following him in these, in these developments. Jacob Prasad, Foundations of the Christian Way of Life, according to First Peter, but chapter 1, 13 to 25, in which this text appears, by his wounds ours will be healed. Well, what we'll do today then is go through that text of First Peter, chapter 1, just verses 18 and 19, yes. which are the more important texts than this. So first of all, Peter, or whoever actually wrote this uh, 
letter, which we call either an encyclical, the first encyclical of the Church, or we think of it as a the remnant, like in Exodus 17 and 18 and so on, the remnant of the first covenant in Exodus, and maybe the remnant of a baptismal ceremony. However that is, these texts begin with, remember. Mm -hmm. Listen, Israel, remember the Lord your God and so on. It was the great prayer of Deuteronomy, which mentions the word today 29 or 30 times. It's not what happened to you folks long ago. It's for you who are here today. So we're asked to remember the sacred memories of ancient Israel, and Jesus will say this when he establishes the Eucharist, you do this in memory of me. So <clears throat> this introduces the reason why the author is stating and appealing to an entire early Christian tradition. He's renewing a, a, a Christian tradition. The readers already are instructed in this. The basic content, of course, of the authentic Christian tradition is, and the author knows that they know this, the story of redemptive liberation. This is already well known to them, <clears throat> and it's freely offered, but they did not serve in any way to have this bestowed on them. So he's trying to tell them, look, guys, this was a real blessing, a real favor. As we all know, uh, people who live together, even in holy marriage, sometimes forget to tell each other, hey, I, you know, I still love you, you know, yeah. after all these years. So it's the Eucharist as a, as a memorial. Remember, man, you are dust, and unto dust you shall return. Remember, man, that this wonderful wound in the side of Christ, out from out of which flowed the precious blood, is our redemption. It so, is easy mm, to mm-hmm. take so, take blessings for granted, mm-hmm. isn't it? And that's to right. forget to be <clears throat> grateful. And that's why, as we have in the famous story of the lepers, there were ten, but only one came back to thank him. So this writer is this letter to the whole church, the early church, which, by the way, was preparing for a persecution. They knew it was coming, that there was a very difficult times, an ordeal was coming. To... So this preacher or teacher or pope or encyclical letter or liturgical booklet, whatever this First Peter is, it begins in these passages, these central passages, remember, keep this in mind, do not be afraid, and so on. Secondly, <clears throat> he uses the word ransom. Well, as we've seen a great number of times, there are many models of redemption. Some say there are as many as 200. Professor Dilliston, who wrote the book uh, Atonement, which is one of the models of redemption, mentions as, as liturgy, athletics, agriculture, economics, and on and on. There are many more. So here, it's either the economic world or the world of uh, juridical redemption. Hey, you were imprisoned, and somebody paid your ransom price. You are free now. Or you were under condemnation, couldn't pay the fine. You were going to go to hell. You were going to be condemned. So this ransom price is well-known biblical term (coughs) with a variety of cognates. In the Greco-Roman world, it really meant a certain high price paid for the liberation of slaves or prisoners of war. You had to pay to be for your freedom. So, by means of a payment of a high price, or the actual handing over of the money to someone who is keeping someone else in captivity, this is so that whoever lets the slave or captive go free really doesn't lose anything. Because so often they would, out of gratitude, would say with the, say with the one who redeemed them. Well, this is, this is what Jesus hopes, that we go from a slavery to sin to a service of God the Father. So, in the matter of freeing slaves, it was something of a legal fiction that they would save their earnings and give the money thus saved to the temple for the price of freedom. Many of these slaves of earlier times were a kind of a bland arrangement. They weren't free to go, and that's never bland. They had a little salary, they had pin money and so on, and as we've seen when we studied St. Paul and the economists, and that, that we, are the, we are the administrators of God's goods. We are not their owners. So in a certain sense, some of these then would use their, try to save up for their own redemption. 
The slave owner then would take the slave to a temple, and the slave would be considered to be redeemed by the god of that temple. That was so even in pagan times. Mm -hmm. So what has happened here, as so often has happened, the Israelites and Jesus Christ took on our entire liturgical life from many roots in the early first covenant uh, ceremonies, the, the, the atonement sacrifices and the sacrifices during the year and so on. So in both the Septuagint of the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, the noun was usually found plural. And that may indicate the highness of the price that they couldn't pay it all at once, but the records of that would be kept. The, the verb is generally found in the passive mood. It is true, once in a while a slave might somehow find the money to pay his own ransom. But for the most part, each and every one is bought and paid for, which we are now today as well. So there's a great debate whether this image came to the New Testament from the price paid for the freedom of slaves or captives or from some other aspect of the Old Testament and broader understanding by God simply freeing the people in the land of slavery through his word. In this latter case, there'd be no actual price that would change hands. It was a ceremony, which it is now. In Daniel 4, there is a liberation of a king from his madness. Yes. <laughs> he went to the temple, and as Saul always wanted David to play the, the violin or the fiddle or the guitar or something, zither, I guess they call it, in Proverbs, repeatedly, 6 and 13, it is used in legal passages regarding a price. So it, is a, it was such an often used ritual that it had many formats over thousands of years which prepared for the coming of the New Testament. Well, with the text in Psalm 130, verse 7, that deeply inspired St. Alphonsus Liguori, himself a lawyer, so much devoted to Our Lady of Ransom and Lady Is, at least, the community was devoted to Our Lady of Ransom. His uh, uh, inspiration here was that the redemption is copious. It's not just enough, and they're bartering over a price to try to take off a few dollars here or there. The firstborn, for example, was redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb. The rich people would bring their new baby, and they'd have a rich a slaughtering of the animal there. Mary and Joseph couldn't afford one, so they had turtle doves. All right. At their, at their ceremony. So redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb, Exodus 13 and 15, Numbers 18, and sometimes a slave or an aspect of the land that was set aside for some other purpose. It's like buying into a contract. Uh, and, and the vows of, of living, like to leave something to your family, to make a dowry agreement, it was always a ransom price to put up a sum of money. The twelve prophets comforted the people and redeemed them by their faith and hope, and the meaning of this word became more and more strengthened and spiritualized or theologized. So your your point, I think, here has to do with that in all of these um, blessings of life, there was mm. some exchange of gifts. That's right. You had mm. received a new child as a mm. gift of God, and you so made a sacrifice in Thanksgiving. A gift back. You mm -hmm. gave a gift back, right. and mm -hmm. now, you know it's. We carry these customs mm -hmm. even yeah. even into now. You, you know, my mother always taught me: don't show up at anybody's house for dinner without a gift, with yeah. empty hand. That's right. That's there right. is always yeah. an exchange for it's, kindness. It's good manners. It's simply good manners. Shows respect for the people we're visiting, and so on. So, with few uh, exceptions in the Old Testament. Countless passages of this term refers to the deliverance, the redemption, the liberation of God's people by God himself, with no actual money paid. There is generally a very close connection or tie with that liberation from slavery connected with the covenant of Sinai. What Part of the thing that was put on them, part of the obligation, the stipulation of that covenant was free your slaves, lessen their time when the next proper time comes around, free them, whereby Israel then became, in this context, as God's firstborn, God's possession, God's people who were bought and paid for. This purchased people appears in First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. 
You are a consecrated nation, a nation, a people set apart, redeemed or ransomed, to sing the praises of God who called you out of the darkness into his own wonderful light. First Peter two nine. So there are a few classical passages of the Old Testament that seems to have set the stage for this term that was used out of nowhere by this author of First Peter. And this would be Exodus 6, 5-7. to And this almost concludes in the covenant with a nuptial formula. Here is the Lord. I have remembered, therefore you remember. This is why it's a memorial. I have remembered my covenant with Abraham. But now we're a book later. We're in Exodus. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of your slavery, and I will deliver you from slavery, and I will redeem you with my outstretched arm and great acts of judgment, and I will take you for my people. I will be your God. You will be my people. Again, Deuteronomy 7, the famous chapter on a passage on vocation. You are a people holy to the Lord. Well, how come? Because he paid for them. He, he, he gave them a land and gave them a chance to live and so on. God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. The Hebrew word here is segula, which meant a very special part of the royal treasury over which no one had any control except the king. I see. And it's something like, I remember as a young priest, I was much surprised and admired President Eisenhower, some potentate from uh, the Mideast, Middle East came, and they sent a contingent of 300 Marines to guard ceremoniously and so on. Well, the potentate, to show his <laughs> gratitude, gave each one of them a priceless gold watch. Mm. I, I never heard the price, but my guess is maybe a thousand or more dollars each one. So when Eisenhower heard this, he said, ah, give them back. Oh. They did. And to my knowledge, no one had a press conference. They just gave them back. And on the other hand, the presidents, when people visit them, give them tokens of particular esteem. I don't know, either a painting or sometimes a statue or some little gift. It's maybe not as much advertised as it used to be. But whenever he went on a state visit, like the Queen of Sheba, the text reads that she knew of this, the, uh, the wisdom of Solomon. She also knew of his treasury. And she needed money. So and the, 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 the deflators of mythical readings of Scripture say, yes, she did. But she also was moved by her necessities and so on. Well, so this idea that you talk about, a, about a certain portion of mm. a king's treasure mm. <clears throat> being set aside for the king's alone. own use, mm. alone, it, it, it perhaps does it tie into our concept of tithing, that there's a certain That's portion right. of our mm. income That's right. that we... It's not set. yours. Hand it over. It's not yours. Mm. You know, you set it aside... Surely. And you, yeah. and you hand it over. That's right. That would not be, that is the, and that is true. But the emphasis here is, this segula, this special possession, this special treasury, it's the treasury that David used for the first down payment on the future temple. Yeah. Something he did for this sacred purpose. So it means God has made you and me and all of us into his special treasure. Only he has dominion over our lives and how we spend them. And if we don't spend them well, we're stealing from the royal treasury. Yes. But with great affection, he takes us back and gives us a new chance. So you will be his own special treasure out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Why? As we look today in the age of the Hamalo telescope, how come there's only life here? It's amazing. Well, this poor man who didn't know of the Hubble telescope, says of all the people in the world, they even knew of China, they knew of something about uh, deep parts of Africa. How come we are the ones chosen? And that remains a mystery. God has chosen you to be his own possession, and out of all of the peoples that are on the face of the earth, it wasn't because you were more powerful 
or more numerous that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you, you were the least of all. It was because the Lord loves you and is keeping an oath which he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and brought you from the land of your persecutors. That's found in Deuteronomy. So from these we can understand this wasn't like buying an object. Sometimes we find even as in the times around President Lincoln where the Supreme Court decided that slaves were belongings. They were not people. Yes. And I think we'll always be sad that the head of the Supreme Court in that time was a Catholic. And ever to have gone that far from our understanding of Scripture, but it's not for me to throw stones because I'm sure in my lifetime I've made other mistakes. At any rate, <clears throat> the particular verb then occurs twice in this passage of First Peter one eighteen, Luke 24, and Titus 2. In Luke, there is no connotation of any price involved. They simply went to the temple and purchased their son with turtle doves because they didn't, couldn't afford the bullock and so on. The disciples and them had expressed their hope that Jesus was going to be the one to ransom them. They considered in no way his death as any kind of a price. They couldn't make that connection. We thought he was going to redeem us, but it was all, it didn't happen. And it was Jesus talking to them and leading them and didn't our hearts burn as he explained God's word to us. So the understanding seems to be more along the lines of the messianic liberation and redemption of the Old Testament. In Titus chapter Titus chapter 2, the text notes that Jesus Christ was the one who gave himself up as our ransom price to, to redeem us. Uh, all iniquity, uh, redeem us from all iniquity and to purify. So this again is redemption from and redemption for. Mm-hmm. Purified for us from sin, for the singing of the praises of God, which is making of our lives a canticle, a, a sacrificial canticle, a canticle of immolation. So the emphasis is much more on Jesus' uh, precious, the precious nature of Jesus, what he gave. The specific mention, no specific mention of Jesus' sacrifice. This seems to be the nature of First Peter, the enormous burden that Christ's dying and the shedding of his blood was for us. All of this was done for us. So <clears throat> the interpreters of these passages tell us that First Peter seems much more in harmony with the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Now, there are many explanations why this is so. Uh, for example, First Peter is a really sacrificial Christology, a canotic Christology, Others would later see the Son of Man coming at the end of time in full glory, surrounded by the angels. But remember, Peter was talking about two simple servants of the Holy Land of the, uh, who were slaves or workers in the land, homes of the rich. So he had to speak to them, not in the way things should be or could be, the way it was, he had to use language and images that they would understand. And all of them seem to have had some understanding of the Old Testament. At any rate, this is the emphasis that Peter makes. Petrine scholars note this characteristic, and they say that First Peter makes use repeatedly, very slyly we might say, or subtly, of the theological passive. I did not create, I was created. I did not redeem. I was redeemed. I am being sanctified. If we give homage to the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, it's God who has redeemed his people through the shedding of Jesus' blood. The people has indeed been redeemed. The people has been bought and paid for at an enormous price. The Apostle's fervent appeal here is that we have been bought at so great a price don't let us ever become slaves of anyone or anything again. Right. This is the appeal so that people suffering, as so often happens with any kind of an addiction, 
would find here that no matter how many times they fall or whatever they fall into, there's a way out. And if that could be some time, be of some help to people suffering from depression or guilt complexes or anger because of what people did to them uh, years ago. So it is very clear, especially as we read Galatians 3 and 4, that God's role in this transaction at such a high price is very active. He just didn't write a check and put it in the mail. He was on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This God so loved the world, he gave up entirely his only begotten son. Well, and that's one of the things that, understanding <clears throat> that, it seems to me, helps us to to imagine a little bit more the difference between Christ's sacrifice and the typical uh, ransom or, or price paid for a blessing. So, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, a couple takes a new baby to the temple mm-hmm. and buys a bullock mm-hmm. to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the temple treasury... Mm-hmm. is better off That's by right. the amount of money. Representing God, of yeah. course. So that the, the, the person or any, any mm-hmm. slave mm-hmm. who pays for his own so, freedom mm-hmm. makes the slave owner mm-hmm. economically better off That's in, right. in the sense of Christ's mm-hmm. redemption of mm-hmm. us. God didn't get money back. Mm-hmm. What God got back was a soul yeah. back to human, his heart, human hearts, that's a human right. heart. Yeah. So, it uh, some of uh, as you always say, all mm-hmm. of these mm-hmm. analogies are mm-hmm. just analogies, that's and right. they they break down if you that, push them quite pull, too hard. They go too far. That's but right. that that sense mm-hmm. that Christ's ransom mm-hmm. was really more mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. a gift. That's right. When when we give a, a gift, the mm-hmm. enrichment that comes is is not monetary. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's uh, emotional or, or, or spiritual. And it makes me think, I mean, I'm not an expert in these things, but I have studied First Peter rather deeply. It seems to me his incessance in this blood ritual is not just the precious blood or the great evil that has been done, but the enormous uh, redemption for which we have been allowed in now. Not only the sins we committed, but far more to think of the graces that God has given to us. And I think in spiritual direction or retreats, when I always try to preach on hope, I said, let your own sins go. Think much more of the mercy of God. A guilt complex, no matter what you say, there are people who will have that. For the rest of that, they just will not accept God in his mercy. We've got to take him at his word. If you fall 70 times 7, you'll be forgiven, as you ask. So what Peter is doing here, very brilliantly, and we never think of Peter as a theologian like Paul or John, but I think he's very subtle here, or at least as an inspiration here, of the enormous effort God has put into saving us, so we are really precious in his sight. You are, you are precious in my sight, and I love you. We read in the Deuteronomy 7 and the Song of Songs and so on. But it's very interesting, you know, as you talk, uh, how readily our minds do mm. tend backwards mm. to mm-hmm. all of those guilty mm. or negative mm. things. Mm. I, um, One of my hospice patients right now, who's fairly close to the end, I was with her and I said to her, what, what are you thinking about these days? Mm. And she said, oh, I'm thinking about all the things Mm -hmm. I did wrong Mm -hmm. in my life, Mm -hmm. all the negative things, the things Mm -hmm. I wish I could Mm -hmm. do over again. And so I said to her, this is what Father Henshi always tells me, so I'll tell it to you, the world of the past is gone. Certainly it's a salutary thing to think about sins. It's the way we begin the Mass each day. It's the way we begin Compline at night. And some, with the Jesuits, would add a third examen of conscience at noon. At any rate, we do need to examine our conscience, but the emphasis is on God's work in this, God's love. Yeah, we love God, but (laughs) we we were out selling peanuts one time, and he brought us into this castle of rich foods and fine wines to spend the rest of our lives and so on, and all eternity. Well, one more thing just before you go on, because I, I think it is an important point. You have made many times, I've heard in retreats, that that this this salutary self-examination 
without hope becomes self-loathing. You know, you say it very succinctly, mm. self-criticism without hope becomes self-loathing. It's simply not Christian. And, and so, you know, it's, it's mm. easy to lose that peace, so you right. keep emphasizing mm. that in your teaching. Well, I had a good teacher named First Peter, and mm. <laughs> the person of Peter, one of the great anuim of the New Testament. So the emphasis here is the high price that God paid, which is still being poured out, or still offered to us every single day to participate more fully in the redemption we have received. This is not some symbol. He didn't give us gold and silver. He gave us the precious blood of his own son. So we find here there is moral slavery, there's religious slavery, there's psychological slavery, mental slavery, and slavery of the will. And all of these slaveries can imprison a man. As we know, a little birdlet can be held back by a thread if it's tied to its foot and the bird can't escape. Let it go in order to let us be. And this is all the invitation of God. Come unto me, all you who labor, and are heavily burdened, and I will refresh you. So the freed person, then, is delivered from slavery for a real free service in the New Testament. We, re- we are redeemed to hand on the gift. We have received to other people, as you do, Lisa, in this hospice work, this very precious work of being present with people as they meet, draw their last breath. It's a, it's a, I knew in Rome the famous Blue Sisters, who this was their main apostolate. So Christians are delivered to enjoy freedom. But they are now the special treasure, that special treasure of Christ himself who paid this tremendously valuable ransom price. There is no concern here who got the, who got the pay. <laughs> the emphasis is on the high price of freedom from sin. Mark 10, Matthew 20. The ransom people are now God's own very special segula or very special treasure. In the synoptic tradition, there's great emphasis on the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. This is very valuable in canonic Christology. But one of the risks of canonic canonic Christology is to think that God gave up, Jesus gave up something of the divinity. That would deny Christology at its core. There's something that Christ has given up, and that what he has given up is open to us the treasures of heaven. So the lowly Christ is exalted, and everybody who is a pilgrim will be welcomed home and will participate in the everlasting banquet of the of the spouse with the lamb. So therefore, what Peter is saying, we have been ransomed for our inner exodus. Mm-hmm. St. Thomas always gives a beautiful insight into this theology. For a sacrifice to be holy, the external ritual of a sacrifice, there is needed the interior mentality of making a change in one's life, or this interior sacrifice. If I'm prone to impatience, if I'm prone to selfishness, or unkindness, or cursing, whatever it may be, we try to make this as our little redemptive response for the great gift that God has given to us. So the background to all of this, of course, is our famous fourth canticle of the suffering servant of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 5. By his wounds, ours are healed. But look at verse 12. And if he offers his whole life in atonement, he will see his heirs and have a long life. And through him, what God wishes will be done. This was Jesus' prayer on the cross. Thy will be done. Not my will, but thine be done. It's our prayer in the Our Father. Hallowed be thy name. And thy kingdom come. Thy will will be done. And this is what we are redeemed for. We accept the wrongs we've done or the hurts we've endured or the suffering, whatever they are, hand them over in this Eucharist of life in the offertory and the consecration of God's pardon and his offering of redemption of his only begotten son brings us to a communion forever. So the Eucharist remains for us a daily reminder. Do this in memory of me. Remind us of all these things. Or this beautiful text in Galatians 2.20 where Paul says, I'm no longer living my own life. I, I'm living the life of Christ who's within me. And he said, he who loved me and gave himself up for me. 
I know God loves me because Jesus died for me on the cross and gave himself up for me. So that is really the synthesis of our theology, which we now consume as bread and wine, or listening to his word, trying to translate it in our own lives. So clearly then, Jesus' death is a supreme act of love. The word redeemed from the Old Testament text really means, as we've seen, we are, each one of us, are already God's very own special treasure. Let us begin to give back our interest, to give back to the Lord, our efforts to lift up our hearts and to trust in Him. Well, another another analogy that also has its that has its uh, limitations, of course, is I think that that it is if as it is as if we are land, beautiful land. Mm. And God has bought us as a piece of mm. land mm. to preserve mm. as a garden, mm. taking it away from the real estate developers mm. to keep the land pure mm. and beautiful. Mm. And and our response, he's mm. kept us because we're mm. so precious, this mm. beautiful, precious land. Our response is to bloom with beautiful flowers, mm. to buzz with beautiful That's little right. insects and animals, our our mm-hmm. response is to be as beautiful a land as mm-hmm. we can be in his in mm-hmm. his precious national park okay. of redeemed that, geography. That, that is a wonderful theme, and I'm sure you'll realize it's biblical, because in the so-called nuptial theme of God's word, one of the themes is that Jerusalem, the city, the territory, is espoused to God, consecrated, handed over to God. This is his city. This is the city of God. So, in a similar sense, we are a spouse, and this means I will go where you go, and I will. your God will be my God. Well, Jesus' God was the Father who gave himself, gave up his only Son, and Jesus gave himself up, the only life that he had, human union in the, in the hypostatic union, the only way of life that he had visibly on earth. So what is Peter asking them to change? And he says, from your former useless way of life. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this must really be explained here. One of the saddest features I think I've ever met in my life as a confessor or spiritual director are people who make no sense out of their life. It has no meaning. I work from dawn till dusk. It's absolutely useless. I, I go to church, okay. That's what I, at least I'm not stealing things. In other words, they've lost. They've been enveloped by the nonsense of life. Yeah. What Peter's saying is thoughts such as those. It's like Jeremiah said, "I'll be a prophet, but I'll no longer say your name. I'll get even with you." In his confessions in Jeremiah 11 to 20, the Lord says, "Jeremiah, come back to me." and say sensible things, and you'll be my prophet. So what Peter is talking about here, these people are slaves. They don't have to be convinced that their way of life is is useless. But he's talking, the spirituality of their life, try to do the best you can in this moment, whatever is coming. Having had a brush with cancer, I really have some understanding (laughs) of fragility. You know, there were days and nights and lengths of time, I really thought I would die in that room in the New York hospital. For whatever reason, I'm here. Here you are. And there was a lot of pain, but a lot of help. I I really got more help than I deserved, and it was inspiring. But regardless of people's faith, these nurses were not doing a job. They all had a vocation, at least the ones I met. So to overcome any sense of despair or discouragement, and as we know in our own time, there's a great serious difficulty in many people's life of depression. And I don't mean to be a kind of a spiritual quack, listen to me and you'll have no depression. That may not be so, but I am sure there are some saints who died in depression. I think of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I think of John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul. It's true he read about, he wrote about the living canticle of love, but his experience was another day. He, he was not immediately illumined with all kinds of consolations in this world. So we do need the Genesis Christ, emptied himself 
and that's what's going now. And in the end, the Lord raised him up, and so on. Well, one other one other aspect of this that that perhaps um, is very relevant to those of us who live in a first world country and are material materially well off, we can be slaves to our possessions. Uh, there's a, a book I I have given to my nieces and nephews when they're young. It's called Your Money or Your Life, mm. and it's a book about how in order to have a lot of things Mm -hmm. or live a certain kind of lifestyle, you have to do a certain kind of work with a Mm. certain intensity Mm. and absorption of time. And and so there's a connection between how Mm. you live, Mm -hmm. you spend your time, and what you own. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you want to own these things or have more freedom for yourself? There's Mm. a there's a thing going on in the United States right now called the small house movement mm-hmm. where people are giving up their houses and living new lives in, in ex- tiny little mm-hmm. places, mm-hmm. 300 square feet. Mm-hmm. And some of the people who have done this say, I'm free, I'm mm-hmm. free yeah. from all these possessions mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. now I can spend my time, I have money, I can, you know, I, it's free. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, another way of saying the true. same thing. And we look at the fragility of human life. I mean, the terrible tragedies have happened through fires and through floods and hurricanes and tornadoes. And how fragile a castle can be swept away in 10 minutes in a flood. Or, or these beautiful homes that are caught in landslides and the work of a lifetime go up in smoke. So these people to whom Peter was writing basically were not landowners. They were slaves. So what Peter means here, instead of your useless way of life, another word would be empty. Your empty way of life. Your worthless way of life. What are you doing for others if we're all day long only remembering our own pain? Wow, a whip of procedure. That's, that's major. It is. Get, get on with it. If the Lord helps us to get over these kinds of things, powerless, futile, no matter what I do, I'm, I, this is the way I am. It's not so. Because future <laughs> is from the verb to be. We used to have great fun as young Latin students, as I know I've mentioned before. What are the four principal parts of the verb to be? Sum, esse, fui, futurus. Future is simply the verb to be projected forward. Advent means somebody comes into our life from the outside, and we think Christ has. And he's talking to us all today in these, his pulpit are the five wounds. He's talking to us as these wounds pour out this message of hope and faith and trust and forgiveness. And that's what he's asking us to, instead of being in useless acts of self-recrimination, confess what we need to confess and get on with life in great hope in the mercy of God. So this verb is used in the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, to emphasize the impact of the foreign gods on Gentile. It's ineffective. It doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't do anything. It's not repentance. Repentance is dynamic and alive and full of hope and piety and trust and love for God. So these useless gods are compared with the living God of Israel, Leviticus 17, Second Chronicles 11, Jeremiah 8 and 10. As those who have never known him as he is in wisdom, 13, 1. Or those who have wandered away from him. Where where are you now? These useless cisterns of your life, newly discovered. So the New Testament term was used here to describe the pre-Christian form of these people once lived by these recent converts, Acts 14, Romans 1, Ephesians 4 and Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 3. So some interpreters think that Peter's real aim here would be Gentile converts. Mm. Well, it's much discussed, as I'm sure, as a Jew would never describe their common heritage as futile, which is very, very true, but the whole argumentation here is sacrifice and blood that would make much more sense to a Jew. But anyway... This is a question for the experts. Our efforts here are not exegesis, of which I am unable, I am not well enough prepared to uh, take on. So the emphasis might be on the very divergent Gentile people. How did Jews and Gentiles even get along? 
Imagine North and South, East and West, liberal, conservative, man and woman, racism and all of ethnicism and all of these horrendous things that have come. So what the Lord is asking through Peter, that this very divergent people, rather with, with their rather loose ethical values, are invited to follow the God of Israel, this desert, this desert God that has no place to lay his head. So redemption is an onerous task. We're not saying, why don't you take a little nap and you'll feel better. But what Peter is saying, look guys, we only have a little while to go. There's this a terrible onslaught that's coming. And Peter himself would die a martyr in that, as would Paul under the Emperor Nero, as many believe. So redemption, it's not easy to do all this stuff because it's with us every day. But what he's appealing here is that the secret thoughts of a quiet afternoon, washing dishes and making dishes, do not turn into anger over the past or guilt complexes or talking about others and so on, to try to lessen this as much as we can. Yet, when all is said and done, Jesus will say, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavily burdened. I will refresh you. My like, my yoke is not heavy. Well, it isn't when compared to heaven. But on a cold day in Chicago, in the rain and the snow, it may be a bit of a burden. So it's, it was not easy to redeem these. Look what it took. Look what it took to redeem Israel. St. Thomas has a very interesting passage where he waxes a little bit eloquent. He said, There is more divine energy in the converting of one sinner than the making of this extraordinary universe. When I read Hubble, I get a little wonder about that. I mean, that the wonders of Hubble and what's out there. This extraordinary mystery of having remembered the the mountains of the Dolomites, the Italian Alps, in the my vacation years in 1953 to 55, unforgettable scenes and the, the butterflies of Brazil and the parrots. My goodness gracious me! At any rate, one sinner costs more than all of that. Well, maybe what what Thomas Aquinas meant was that in all of in all of creation. Nobody, nothing fought back against God. Mm. You know, the sun That's didn't right. say, "I'm That's not right. going to do what That's you want." Right. Yeah. Let there be light. No, yeah. I don't think so. Or maybe for five minutes, and sure. then I'll go out again. Where, where the conversion of a sinner sure. uh, involves a a creature of free will and sure. cooperation, and we don't. But as we know too, lava, hot lava, going into the ocean hisses in anger and so on, but ends up a new island. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. so the father's burden was he did not spare his only son, but offered him up. You and I would have a very hard time even imagining the surrender of a natural child for an adopted one. Now, I know parents who have adopted. My own beloved nephew was adopted, and we never considered him anything different. But there's a natural bond. And people love, as we know, the court system when there's a fight over over the uh, proper uh, position of a child is with the natural parents as much as this can be. So God so loved the world. He developed this idea in his wisdom and provided an enormous cost. The ransom was not paid in anything perishable. The context is very reminiscent of Isaiah 52. You were sold for nothing and redeemed without silver and gold. I'm sure people who are struggling with their addictions might, like I think of people I've known and loved that struggle with alcohol or others with drugs or sexuality, whatever it is, just get overwhelmed. And when compared with peace of mind, which Bishop Sheen used to preach to us about, there's really no comparison. The great peace of mind that comes from trying to do the best we can, whatever hand of cards life has dealt us. So Isaiah is fulfilled here. God is the agent of this redemption. It seems that the grammatical construction here would not even allow the the hint of a price. Redemption here means moral transformation. It's redemption for. Well, not only from sin. We usually, when we understand, well, I've been redeemed from sin. For what? What are you supposed to do now? 
Mm. Bend your knee, bend your head, bend your heart to the mercy of God, and so on. So redemption is a moral transformation, effecting deliverance from a vain way of life, whatever that may be. So the shedding of the precious blood of Christ is an infusion of new life for all of us, if we can use modern terms. Silver and gold can perish and be lost on the stock market, but the blood of Christ and its effects cannot be dimmed in time. So what Peter's message is, that it be intensified, that it be made more fervent. And this is the great effusion, infinite value of the ransom price. The shedding of one's own blood indicates a much higher price than shekels <laughs> taken from his pocketbook. I mean, I grew up in the era of World War II, and a couple of kids in my neighborhood never came back. And uh, another friend of dear, two dear, three dear friends of mine died in the Korean War. Well, would anyone compare that sacrifice to the taxes we have to pay? Mm-hmm. Or I think of a Sunday collection. Some people can very simply put in good money and spend the rest of their lives criticizing the church, God, and everybody in between. You know, so it it all asks something of us all, a, a greater kindness to one another. Well, I think that's why mm. sometimes the, the evangelical custom <clears throat> of being born again when you... Um, when you accept Christ in your life Mm -hmm. as the guiding force in your Mm -hmm. life. It it sounds cliched, it sounds caricatured, uh, it can sound very trite and silly, Mm -hmm. but that notion that that you recognize Mm -hmm. that now you have been Mm -hmm. bought and paid Mm -hmm. for, and Mm -hmm. now you bend your knee and go forward in a different way of life. You Mm -hmm. leave the past behind Mm -hmm. and you start anew. Mm -hmm. There's some some good about that. And I think, really, we have that built into our Catholic spirituality. Ongoing conversion, ongoing formation, it never ends. The intellect, the will, psychology, way of life, outlooks, all of these things need to be constantly converted. The difficulty is sometimes the evangelicals have a bit of advantage, if that's the right word, by coming into enthusiastic gift, which sometimes doesn't last the real heavy struggles, mm-hmm. and neither does our conversion. So I think the biblical idea is yes, a new way, a new evangelical way of life, the radical understanding of the gospel. What does the gospel mean? Give up your life for Jesus Christ, for your fellow human beings, and so on. That's that's a good point, though, Lisa. So here, Peter is emphasizing the redemptive power of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is a relatively new thing. As we saw in the Old Testament, there was a kind of a wishy-washy idea of expiation. How can the blood of an animal wash away my sin? It can't. It simply cannot. God, I suppose, in his infinite power could have made that possible, but he didn't. The lamb was a projection forward in the fullest sense. The lamb of sacrifice of Exodus becomes the second person of the Trinity in in John's Gospel chapter when, when John the Baptist says, look, there is a lamb of God. So this is the central Catholic teaching that Peter is recalling. He should remember Israel. Remember this message, it's Acts 20, Romans 3, Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 9, over and over again, the value of the precious blood. The efficacy of blood has ancient roots in the Old Testament. It's identified with one's soul, one's life, Leviticus 17, Genesis 9, Deuteronomy 12. And this is what we read in that famous text of of Deuteronomy. The life of all flesh is in the blood. I have given it for you upon the altar and make atonement for your souls. But it's the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life it conveys. For the blood as a life is a sacred thing. A sacred thing and reserved for the altar. That's not from Deuteronomy, but that was a commentary on the fact that blood is the principle of life. So therefore, blood is the most suitable, natural instrument for purification consecration and union with God. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing, the symbolisms and the multiple readings of symbol. Take, for example, oil. <clears throat> well, we use oil for many things as a condiment. 
We use it as a lamp. Mm -hmm. We use it as uh, re reducing friction in right. an engine. We use it to uh, preserve. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the one symbol, you can understand why it would be used as a sacrament. Water and, and uh, bread are another. Well, so is, so is in bl blood, a very special symbol. Blood is eminently divine because it, it cannot be consumed. You cannot consume the animal, animal's blood. We do because Jesus, being the Son of God, partake of his precious blood. So that's the main, one of the main dogmatic points that Peter makes. Secondly, this precious blood of the, of the Lamb of God flows forth from divine love. And we will add here, through his sacred stigmata, producing faith, hope, and love. What did the Apostle Thomas say? My God and my Lord. And that's the first step of a new conversion. And then he goes off, as is piously believed, to India. And we have still to this day the famous St. Thomas Christians. So, <clears throat> yes, <laughs> we have accepted the precious blood. But a new lifetime, not a feeling, but of a deeper conviction, a deeper commitment, if those are the right words. So this precious blood, this sacrificial terminology, opens up so many thematic connections. And this is why a course like this is like getting a drink from a hydrant. There's just mm -hmm. so much to consider. And hopefully some of these applications from various passages and booklets of the New and Old Testaments might help us a little to zero in on the message. The, the love of God heals all of our wounds. There's a great emphasis here on the, the lamb who is faultless without blemish. The sacrificial victim needs to be perfect. And there's a very unusual passage in, in uh, Hebrews when speaking about Christ was made perfect in his oblation. Well, he was never imperfect. So mm -hmm. what are they talking about? Well, many people think his priesthood. Mm -hmm. His priesthood was perfected in his self-immolation. And when we try with Romans 12 to exercise the priesthood of the baptized, make of your life an oblation to the mercy of God, it's an immolation when we persevere that we hang on until the end. So, of course, this is the Lamb of God of Exodus. This is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 who offered his life in atonement. So many scholars hold that Old Testament sacrifices could not redeem, but only expiate, wash away a little bit. So anyway, with the new reflection, we'll now look in the next, the second excursus in the next reflection on the sacred side of Jesus. And this then will permeate the rest of the course. So in order to do this, we need to show the symbolism and the development of John's Gospel. And we'll do that in the next reflection. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you, Father, for teaching. And um, as you say, there is so much. And even as I sit here and listen to you, I know much is going over my head, much is going past me. But there are always uh, there are little snatches of things that I can catch as they fly by that give me some food for thought and some contemplation. Well, that's what God's Word is like, the the seed that brought the pineapples to Hawaii. Yeah. How did they get over 6,000 miles of ocean? There was a, a thistle in the wind. Yeah. And sometimes it takes root in the, in the open human heart. That's right, that's right. So thank you once again for teaching, and will you conclude this uh, episode with a prayer? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Pray for us, Holy Spouses, Mary and Joseph that we, we may, may be, be made, made worthy of the promises of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you once again, and see thank you next you time. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.